What do you want people to know about East St. Louis in the decades that came after what happened that day? The decades that came after, people carried that memory as trauma. Mm. And I think one of the most important things we should do is to understand that when people don't want to tell stories, it's not because they want to forget it, it's because they don't want to relive it. Those are two very different things. What Father Joseph Brown is talking about happened more than 100 years ago. It was July of 1917. And while accounts of how it started differ, Brown, a professor of Africana studies at SIUE and many others, want you to know the whole story. But since my father's family was living here in East St. Louis at the time of the riot, I knew about it from childhood because they would talk about how they had to hide people under the front porch. Wow. So I think that was one of the, no, I don't think, I know that was one of the motivations that forced me into calling people into a, com a conversation about having the 1917 Centennial Commission. So what happened in that first week of July? Congressional reports show after several cars fired shots into black neighborhoods, two white police officers ended up shot. What happened next would leave parts of the city in ruins and people dead at 11 p.m. on July 1st. This sound. A bell at True Light Baptist Church rang, and violence against Black East St. Louisans was erupting everywhere. On July 2nd, white men and women beat, shot, and set ablaze their innocent Black neighbors. They burned down homes with people inside. They pulled men, women, and children off of streetcars. And as the story goes, National Guardsmen and police just watched. What is unique about the program on July the 2nd is the magnitude and that it all occurred at one time. But to tell the whole story means to tell many stories. Judge Milton Wharton, who's also on the commission to preserve this story, recalls one. Yes, there's a particular story of a family that returned on a streetcar from a day fishing. A wonderful day, they were having a picnic and a fishing trip, and they wound up in downtown St. Louis in the heat of the riot. The rioters came in, shot and killed the lady's husband, shot and killed her son, and then they turned on her and they beat her. And there was one white individual who had the courage to step forward and protect her and prevent her from being killed. That, that very much stands out uh, in my mind about the horrors of, of this particular incident. So where did the massacre happen exactly? The simple answer is a little bit of everywhere. It happened at McCasland and 11th Street, parts of 10th and Bond, but anyone will tell you much of the violence happened in the downtown area. At the time, a St. Louis Post-Dispatch reporter counted six bodies in the street at one point, and we know several people were lynched. Are, were there any other stories that they would talk about? Well, there was the one that I also knew about, and that is that, that corner around Collinsville Avenue and 4th Street, or down there where the Broadview Hotel is now, or used to be. And I can remember my father pointing out, saying, you know, they hung somebody up there. To get away, people ran for their lives down the train tracks. Entire families escaped to the municipal free bridge where white rioters tried to stop them, killing some. Are there any parts of it that you'll remember always, or is there any story that sticks with you and your learning of what happened? Some of the things that stick with me are the brutality and the vicious ways that people were murdered by women. When you hear the stories of women gathering around the streetcars, pulling black women and their children off, 
those cars and beating them to death, or standing around yelling at people in the houses when they were burning the houses down, forcing the people to come out and be shot, and the babies being thrown back into the houses. And the fact that so much of that mob activity was organized in what we would now call the red light district of East St. Louis, where there were the bars, the gambling joints, and the brothels. And so it was gender inclusive, the mob. And when you think about what happened in 2021, 2017 in Charlottesville, what we have seen, what, what we have always known about America's history, it has always been quite inclusive the violence and the death and destruction. We revisited several sacred sites where Black East St. Louisans lost their lives and their homes, entire neighborhoods flattened, entire families gone. That includes right here at 10th Street and Trinley Avenue. We didn't, it wasn't a constant conversation, sure. but I knew about it. Yeah, yeah. And I knew how ugly it was. So was anyone ever held accountable for these heinous acts? In some ways, yes. In others, the injustice just continued. This really wasn't an isolated incident. Extrajudicial executions of African Americans were occurring frequently prior to what happened on July the 2nd, and they continued afterwards. But you can't tell the story of the East St. Louis race massacre without talking about Dr. Leroy Bundy. Bundy was a black dentist and a community leader. His home stood right here. He was wrongfully charged for starting the massacre. He stood trial and was even found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Later, the Illinois Supreme Court exonerated him. As for everyone else, more than 100 people were indicted. That included a number of police officers and 23 black men. The mayor at the time, Fred Mullman, even faced a charge of malfeasance. But with whole families and neighborhoods completely wiped out, was that enough? No, not even close. Reginald Petty was born and raised in East St. Louis and says his family passed down the story from generation to generation. And I remember my, my parents, my, my, uh, uh, father, my father talking about the number of relatives that disappeared. Um, so, so in your family? Yeah, my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, he talked about, I remember him talking about that he was, somebody worked in the stockyards mm -hmm. and they were coming home and they were pulled off the, off the train uh, in the stockyards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, on the, down, somewhere downtown, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, disappeared. I remember it, it, it helping produce a fear in me right. of these white people. You know, be, be careful. You know, and also in just. Um, and, but I didn't hear any more about it. I don't think until I was maybe in college. Mm. It was like the elders of our community wanted to give us an upbringing free of much of the stress and brutality that many of them had experienced in the South. What happened on that day in 1917 would become a difficult story to tell for generations to come. It's a part of that because of the pain that comes with that story. Of course. Dr. Lillian Park says it was a while before she learned the story herself. Did you learn about it in school? Yes, to a certain degree. Okay. We taught civics. Uh, the story was 1917 race riot. Mm -hmm. Very, very bad, terrible. Yeah. Hurt our children, mm -hmm. hurt the town. It really was something that we were not able to really get back if we wanted to, but. We did, to a point we did. And so when that comes up, I just say, we did the best we could. Mm. 
Parks is a lifelong educator, having spent more than four decades in the classroom. She'd even serve as the superintendent. A black woman never had that. Wow. And I said, there are some things we need to do. Mm -hmm. And we did them. Though retelling the story is extremely hard, Father Brown says it's for that reason that it has to be told. There were two aspects of my idea of bringing this commission together. Mm -hmm. One was to heal the land where the blood was spilled. Mm -hmm. We had to have some kinds of rituals to name the places, to pray over them, mm -hmm. and to honor the ancestors who died there. Yeah. The second one was to make sure that there was always going to be a component that taught our young it is not about how bad and how traumatic it was. It's how we have survived and transformed the trauma into action. Why is it so vital that the commission exists and that the work continues? Because history is still not being taught well. Mm. And part of the game that we knew was rigged against us mm -hmm. was that what we grew up knowing, our young people did not know. Mm. So we made it our highest priority. We were not totally successful in all that we wanted to accomplish, but we made sure that that Centennial Commission will always have some impact, some impact on this city because we want our young people to know. As the slogans and the posters said, East St. Louis, the city that survives. Part of that has to do with how the story is passed down, making sure that it tells the whole story. Do we have an estimate or do we know how many people lost their lives that day or is it hard to even know? We will never know how many people lost their lives. They weren't gonna be counting the people that they threw back into burning buildings. There were no bodies. They're not gonna count the people that they threw into ditches and rivers and streams and they're not ever going to count the people who were buried in mass graves. So when people say maybe 40 or 50 people, no, I'm gonna say hundreds of people. And we don't know the people who fled here and died somewhere else. We don't know because people might have moved to Kinlock, Missouri, and died there. They may have died in the hospital in St. Louis. So they're not gonna be reporting that because black lives did not matter. That also means using the right word to describe what happened in the first place. And one of the things that we as a commission had to choose to do was to stop calling it the East St. Louis Race Riot and change it to Charles Lumpkin's preferred term that he wrote his book about, the American Pogrom, that word from Eastern Europe in which genocide was being inflicted upon Jews, for instance wiping out a group of people, the pogrom, or the massacre. Because until the 1960s, the word riot always referred to mobs of white people going into black communities, killing inhabitants. And now we have large, large gatherings of black and other people protesting for civil rights and justice and if things are being destroyed, it's businesses, it's property, it's materials. Not, they do not go into neighborhoods to kill people. But the word riot has been imposed upon them. And we did not want that word to be here because it doesn't tell us the whole truth. It's a pogrom. It was genocide and it was organized. So what makes East St. Louis East St. Louis? For this commission, it's not only their love for where they come from. This was an idyllic opportunity for children to grow up. It felt very protective, insulated. It's also about making sure the world knows where it's been, all the places it has left to go, and who it could be. And if you don't know your history, you will be trapped when somebody else throws it to you in a corrupted version.
people survived it. And instead of saying, oh, those poor people, we might want to say, could you all teach us some survival skills? Mm. That could change America. It could change the way we do things across cultures, gender status, economic status. Wait a minute, you survived all of that. Yeah. I know you got some lessons to teach us. Mm. Come to East St. Louis and find out what they are. For Living St. Louis, I'm Gabrielle Hayes.